welcome to the Dahl Global Lounge. This is a show where we discuss the impact of diversity, inclusion and belonging with the world's most successful and innovative leaders. Today we have a very special lounge indeed, dedicated to black lives and obviously what we're seeing in the world at the moment with the call for black lives to matter it is a rallying cry for all black people and everyone else in the world striving for liberation and equality. Moreover, COVID-19 is an ongoing issue for the foreseeable future and because there are so many questions and unknowns surrounding the current environment as a future and as a result everyone must take responsibility for stepping up to the plate and leading through these uncertain times. Today's Dial Lounge brings together a panel of exceptional sports professionals and business leaders from the world of sport and business who will provide their insight and advice for navigating through these trying times. Today, we're joined by John Barnes, an ex-international former football player and manager, currently working as a commentator and sports pundit for ESPN and Supersport, Sanjay Bandari, chair of Kick It Out, David Grevenberg, CEO at the Commonwealth Games Federation, and Andrew Pierce, managing director of Accenture. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. And by way of introductions, just for those whom are, I know the vast majority of us and those who will be tuning in know who you are, but just by way of um, a quick round robin introduction, I wonder whether we could do a little introduction into how we are feeling and the impact that we're having and seeing at the moment. David, I'm going to start with you if that's okay. That's fine. Thank you very much, Leila. And it's uh, good to, to see and meet uh, all of you, uh, albeit uh, virtually. Yeah, I think the past uh, several weeks, you know, not just including the pandemic, but I would say particularly um, with uh, the rise uh, and, and further, I would further debates around Black Lives Matter, um, has been a fantastic focal point for an organization such as the Commonwealth Games Federation which uh, has, you know, uh, by its very context and brand name, a important part to play in the broader conversation around uh, issues around freedom, fairness, equality, and, and justice. Um, and so we as a federation uh, have been working over the past several years around how we uh, it really embed in our culture as an organization, the conversation and meaningful actions around addressing our links to colonialism uh, in some of our countries, uh, issues around post-conflict and how we use the games and the actors of the event, uh, including our athletes and the coaches, officials and so forth as advocates, agents, an activist for change. Um, and I think this has all really come to a very uh, strong focal point over the past uh, few weeks with Black Lives Matter. We sent an open letter to sport um, about two weeks ago, really calling for serious action, not just for us as a, as a federation or an institution, but as sport as a whole, um, and giving ourselves the social and moral license to, to really embrace this important conversation not in terms of just uh, responding to a trend of activity, but truly living our values and, and actually practicing what we've been discussing for a long time now. Um, so it's uh, very defining. Um, a lot of people, I think, uh, over the past few weeks have started to open their eyes and more importantly, open their ears. People have listened, but I'm not sure have always heard. And I think that is, uh, that is really starting to take form and take place. And I'm encouraged with some of the conversations and some of the, the courage, but, but also the openness to, to make the, or be the change we want to see. So I'm, I'm, uh, it's, been, it's been a whirlwind. Um, and as we were talking before we, we came on air, yes, it's tiring, but it's so important and, and enriching at the same time. Thanks so much, David. Sanjay? Yeah, I think I'm very similar. I'm feeling tired, but optimistic. So I have 
I have a portfolio of roles. I do a number of different things and actually all of the organisations I'm involved in, we're all looking at impacts of COVID-19, impacts of Black Lives Matter. Uh, obviously, in particular in the, in the role at Kick It Out, I'm really focused on um, solutions. Uh, I think we can spend a lot of time in the problem and uh, identifying the problem and talking about the problem. Um, I really want to look to the future and how we create solutions and things that can have an impact now, things that can have an impact over the longer term. We have to, we have to be able to look back in five years time and say, this was a moment of change. This wasn't, to quote the Sex Pistols, a cheap holiday in other people's misery. You know, we have to make this the moment of change. So I'm really focused on, I want concrete action. Thank you, Sanjay. And I saw uh, saw the article that you did recently, which I must commend you on. But um, we'll come on to that later. Um, I know a number of you have been in the press recently um, speaking out, which I think is fantastic. Andrew. Yeah, I mean, I all agree with what David and Sanjay are saying. And the first thing is, again, with a portfolio of, of roles within the business world, not only with it next venture, um, obviously operating the business as an MD in operations, but with my clients, um, but also as a sponsor of the African Caribbean Network within Accenture and the chair of the Executive Leadership Council, which is a global organization dedicated to ensuring that we develop black global leaders. And I think over the last two, you know, three, four weeks, it has been very tiring. It's been tiring because business wasn't sure how to respond. They knew they had to respond. They knew to have to respond in a positive way and they had to send a, a very clear message of support from what was required. And, and the point is, and I think Sanjay's already alluded to this, we've been in these points before when we've had discussions and you know, people have ticked a box and said, yeah, okay, well, that's fine. We understand we've got to do something about it. And then you know, a month later, you're back to exactly where you, where you came from. And so there's been this constant fatigue when you work in this area that people are not listening and you're not seeing the change. Of course, we've seen some change, but not the change where we see representation, where we see actually people begin to understand what it feels to be from different ethnicity, whether it's in sport or business or in society, and the systemic racism that exists. But I think the difference this time is that people are no longer listening to us, they're listening as us. There is still a long way to go because to create those advocates for change takes time. And people don't know how to speak, don't know the language to use, don't know actions to take, and that is a learning process. So I agree, it is a moment, but it is also a continuous dialogue. Um, but what matters is that that change is sustained and we keep going because we cannot keep coming back to that point. It's a shame it took a catalyst of tragic events for us to actually get to this position, but now we're here, we need to maintain it and continue that dialogue and create those real advocates because that is how we will maintain and sustain the change. Many thanks, Andrew. And, and, and last but never least, John. <laughs> well, I'm not tired. If I was, I would have been tired 20 years ago. This hasn't just started. And we're talking about a moment of change when we've been to this point before. For many hundreds of years, we've been to this point. From the abolition of slavery to the civil rights movement, this is not the first time. And we shouldn't be arrogant enough to think that oh, this is now the moment of change because we're advocating for change, as if this hasn't happened before, where people thought that things would change. But we're convincing ourselves that now it'll change because why? Now, from a business point of view, from a legal point of view, from a policy point of view, yes, things have been improving for the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years, very, very slowly, but it's been improving. And we, we may even see that improve now. But until the perception of what a black man is changes, nothing will matter. Because what will happen is that you look at policy, you look at from a legal point of view, you look at the Rooney Rule, you look at the affirmative action, you look at the more visible signs of black people on television, as we've seen in the last two weeks. The amount of people are now on GNB, we listen to Pierce Morgan, now being an advocate for, for, for diversity, um, whereas six weeks ago he wasn't, so is he really? And our people now who are talking about, yes, we have to change, really interested in change. And the only way we can change is if we change perceptions. That's the only way we can change because we could always change perceptions of me, of Sanjay, of Andrew, of Obama, of Beyonce, but until we see the average black man in the street as equal, we will never be equal. And that is what 
while we have to do lots of advocating for lots of different things from a business point of view, from a sport point of view, from a visibility on television point of view, black managers point of view, 90% of people aren't going to be black footballers, aren't going to be managers, aren't going to be businessmen, and what is happening to them. And that is why what Marcus Rashford did, although that is not necessarily a black issue, but an issue whereby the change he's affected in two days, three days, by highlighting the injustice of inequalities in the inner cities where black people are disproportionately represented. And as much as I say this is not a black issue, you can see when a black superstar comes out to talk about what's happening in the community, how things can change for the community. Now, what can happen because of what I've seen on television in terms of black representation on television, and of course now Sky and all these companies are now phoning me to, 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 to come and you know, do television and do football for them, that may change, but is that gonna help 90% of the people? 99% of the people, no it's not. And the only thing that will help them is if we change our perception of the situation. Now we can see in the last two weeks what's been going on in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, where it has kind of like, uh, muddy the waters a bit because you've got lots of other people wanting different things. You talk about statues being thrown in, you're talking about lots of different people wanting change. And once again, if we're going to go down that route, we have to look and see uh, in terms of what the whole of Britain has done. You know, I, I'm, I'm interested, obviously I'm, I'm very pleased that, um, that, that David's here because the Commonwealth Sports Awards, the Commonwealth Games, what they're actually doing is a very positive thing. Ironically, because the Commonwealth created by exploitation and atrocities. That's how the Commonwealth was created. So as much as the Commonwealth um, Federation, Commonwealth Games Federation is now doing lots of good work, we have to understand how that started. And we have to be balanced in explaining to people exactly what goes on. So I think it's gonna be a multi-agency approach in terms of different people doing different things. But what I am doing and what I try and do all the time is to say, yes, we need black managers, we need black actors, we need them getting Oscars, we need all of that. But the most important thing that we need is to change the perception of the black inner city communities. That's what we have to do. And as much as people say to me all the time, we have to do both, you know, in terms of the elites getting positions and also the communities getting more equality. It's a little bit like the black lives matter, all lives matter. Yes, all lives do, all lives do matter. But there's something more urgent, something more pressing that we have to do now. And what's more urgent and more pressing now, rather than a black manager, is... Education, jobs, social, access to social care in the inner cities. So, and I don't see many people doing both. I see a lot of people doing one, but not many people doing the other. And that is where I'm so proud of Marcus Rashford. Rather than talking about we need more black men in the boardroom, as some footballers say, he says, let's help our kids to get a school, school dinners. So as I say, I, I think that now it seems as if we're going to take this seriously, but it's a very worrying time and an dangerous time for us now to be going, taking a knee, looking at George Floyd, being the, 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 the catalyst for this, when we can then say, what's going on in this country? And in this country, we can then say, let's support what's happening in America. And let's say to our BAME, I don't like that, that, that term either, but let's say to the, the black community here, how lucky they are to be here in England, because it could be worse. You could be in America where police are, ki are, are killing people. And pat ourselves on the back to think that things are necessarily better here, which they're not. So this is a dangerous time where we have to really be honest about how we really feel. Mm -hmm. Some really powerful words there from all of you. Thank you very much, John. And, and I absolutely concur. I mean, it is absolutely making sure that the narrative of the history is told correctly in order to ultimately change those perceptions. And that means very uncomfortable conversations. And you now I think, you know, one of the positive things that I have seen, you know, not, in, not least with all of you, is that leaders are actually willing um, to speak out. You know, David, yourself especially, white leaders, allies, Black leaders, BAME, I know that we don't necessarily like this term, we are going to be talking about beyond BAME, um, but leaders putting a line in the sand and saying, look, you know, we aren't necessarily perfect, but hey, we're willing to speak up and say what we are willing to do in order to take action and affect change. Because like you say there, John, this is not a one-dimensional issue. It's multifaceted. There never would ever be a silver bullet that suddenly brings us into a wonderful world where there is equality. It is factored from lots and lots of different levels. But I know I, I agree. I think Marcus, Rush, uh, Marcus Rushford, you know, the school dinners, um, making sure that uh, there is, you know, some of the most simple 
things are, you know, are, are changed. And he's obviously got Boris to, to, to change his mind, which is good. It's amazing how much of an impact that influences like yourself and all of you can, can have, which, you know, I guess also, whilst we've touched on it, my first question really was, can sport have an impact on wider society and business? And how can we ultimately leverage this in order to factor change? It's obvious that football can and, and, and other sports, and, and maybe you have to separate football from the rest of sports, you know, because there's there, there almost is football and other sports. Football is very, very different. But, but of course, sport can have an influence, as Marcus Rashford's demonstrated, as Raheem Sterling is demonstrating, as people with a platform. And, and actually, that influence has grown bigger over the last 10 to 15 years because uh, of social media. You know, actually, social media is part of the business model for modern sports people because there's a reason why Cristiano Ronaldo is the first billionaire sports person. It's because of his Instagram following. You know, and, and that is part and parcel of the way that sports people build their, I suppose, their business models with their, with their, with their agents. Uh, but actually, that gives them an enormous influence, bigger in the same way that corporations are bigger than states. Corporations have an impact beyond jurisdictional boundaries and actually it's it's businesses that are more influential than governments in, in many ways in sport it's been turned on its head in that individual players can be more powerful than many of the clubs that they represent so if they choose to take up a particular cause they can have a massive impact and marcus has, has shown that this week what there is though is and i think john's kind of hinted at it, is everything's kind of fragmented. <laughs> it's actually getting some of the unity to, to, to call for the similar kinds of actions or the right kinds of actions that we need. Uh, so one of my sort of general frustrations is every time we have an incident, you know, in, in, in you know, my particular focus is on football, but I'm interested obviously in more broad society, but every time you have an incident, there's this mass gathering of media, much gnashing of teeth and hand-wringing, loads of condemnations, uh, loads of talking heads on TV, loads of radio phone-ins, and then everyone coming up with one simplistic answer to a really complex problem. And everyone's saying, well, that is the answer. And I've, had, I've, I've, been, I've been cornered in a circular room by people telling me very, very close, this is what we need to do, right? Now, the reality is, Every one of those people with a simplistic answer, that is part of the, part of the answer. But these are much more complex problems. Uh, and, and it's a whole bunch of different things that are going to be, and a bunch of different interventions that are going to be, that are going to be the answers. What we need is if you've decided you're going to get involved and you're going to uh, be angry about this, stay involved. Stop being a commentator and start being a contributor. We need you to stay involved and get involved in the solutions. So, um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, for football, sports, business can influence broader society, but it can't if you do this, if we maintain this staccato, pas uh, staccato pattern of incident, outrage, collapse of the, of the news cycle, then move on and then rinse and repeat at the next time. You have to make this the moment you say, I'm going to stay involved and I'm going to stay involved in understanding the problem and having the patience to work with this over a number of years because some of the things in particular that john talks about those are all absolutely right the perceptions uh, that, that he talks about are all absolutely right that is what's out there that isn't going to change overnight that's a that's a slow process to change people's perceptions thanks for sharing sanjay and no, I, I agree with you on that. And you alluded to this actually in the article that, that I read that was in the Times um, around players using influential platforms to be able to protest. And by protest, obviously, I, uh, I mean um, peaceful, in inverted commas, protest, because I personally don't agree with, you know, maybe statues being torn down um, in across the country. I don't think it will necessarily help. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, it is absolutely critical that these powerful voices are utilized to the best uh, to be able to influence in a positive manner because you're right you know to a degree players are more you know more influential sometimes than teams themselves yeah Leila, I, I mean I, first of all i mean it's just wonderful to to listen to all of you and you know, i think uh you know as a, a white middle-aged man from the southern united states <laughs> who who has been privileged 
and probably raised, uh, not probably, was raised with a certain bias and, and has been recovering from that privilege, bias and prejudice his whole life um, in many respects. I grew up in the city of New Orleans and uh, you know, for, for those of you that may, it's probably, uh, Don is probably closer to the Caribbean than, than, than the States in any, <laughs> any, any, any day. Um, the more I, the more I travel, travel uh, throughout the Caribbean, the more I realize how close I am <laughs> in spirit and uh, culture. But what I've, what I've really reflected on over the past several weeks is how ill-equipped <laughs> many white people are, and particularly white men. You know, because we work in patriarchal hierarchies beyond race. Just if we start to look at what we work in in our societies, in government, in universities, in 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 banks, in in sport, we have patriarchal hierarchies, and the majority are populated in terms of leadership roles at that uh, C-suite level with white men, and how ill-equipped many white men are in terms of having. Uh, that ability to self-reflect and understand that these conversations that are happening right now in society, what is my role and what can I do differently? And am I looking at, am I part of the solution or am I part of the problem? And I think that being able to reflect on that constructively and with the right language, with the right terminology is a learning process for many. And I'm not saying um, the, it's not making excuses. It's it's just saying that's my observation. Is that I, I think we people fundamentally lack the perspective and they lack the skill sets uh, to, to to actually address some of these uh, really systemic and salient issues. And what ends what ends up happening is people run away from the conversation, don't embrace the conversation, or scared of the conversation, instead of taking that position of humility, respect, listen, learn, and then contribute, you know, and, and be much more in tune with, you know, I don't need to control the situation. I need to engage the situation. And I think particularly sport, when I look at sport leadership and I look at athletes, you know, I, I think that the leadership of sport, whether that's administrators or officials or have an ability right now to empower athletes and to empower the institutions of sport. Football is a very distinct institution in terms of its width, its breadth, its influence, its appeal um, at, at, many, at many levels. But I, I do think there are some commonalities across sport that uh, it is an incredibly powerful platform. It transcends uh, you know, socioeconomic uh, barriers. It transcends race in, in many in many cases. Certain sports uh, do that better than others. You know, football I think is is one. Uh, boxing, wrestling, you name it. You know, wrestling was my sport, so I'm I'm going to of course be partial to that. Uh, <laughs> but I, you know, really looking looking at this, I think sport can no longer claim to be inclusive and community relevant and continue to act exclusive and privileged. It, it, the day of reckoning has come. Um, and I think sport needs to now you know, basically put, it, put its actions where its mouth is. And one final point is, uh, is really around the role of the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth Games. Probably eight years ago, as a Commonwealth sport movement, we started to have this very difficult conversation about truth, where we come from, why are we the Commonwealth? What does it mean for each of you as Commonwealth citizens, if you've ever thought of that? And it, what we found is that when we move beyond this notion of the British Commonwealth and start to have this discussion on a global Commonwealth, the role that sport plays in addressing the truth, the repair, the reconciliation of colonialism and post-conflict in the case of uh, places like Rwanda is 
fundamental, it's foundational, it's impactful, but then also upholding all of these ideals that the 53 countries now have signed up to in terms of peace, prosperity, good governance, and human rights. You can't have one without the other. And the bottom line is, is that we see ourselves very much on a journey, not a destination. We're not trying to, we're going to reconcile and we'll put all that behind us and move on. No. Every day in my life until I die and my children's lives after me will be continuing to uphold truth, rep you know, um, repair and reconciliation. And that's, that's part of who we are. And I think that that's, you know, whether it's stateside or whether that's here in the UK or whether that's in the, the, street, the, street of, the streets of Trenchtown or, or Soweto or Mumbai, I can tell you, you know, this is a common conversation. So, you know, we try to use a narrative uh, and a positioning and create our power of convening people to open those conversations up. Some to the relief of others, some to the concern of others, and that's part of the journey. So I think you know, sport does have a fundamental role to play because it has the power to convene and has the power. You know, I'm, I'm not going to recite the, the, the famous Mandela speech on uh, the power of sport, but we have to remember when, when Madiba said that, it was on the back of uh, a fight for freedom, a fight for fairness, a fight for equality, and a, and a fight for justice. And so, yes, I hands down am a believer that sport is a major agent of change and the actors that practice and, and participate and lead sport have a fundamental opportunity, but more importantly, a duty of care and responsibility to take everyone with us. Thanks so much for sharing, David. And as always, I, I absolutely love speaking with you. I think you're, you're your absolute humility and genuine honesty is is something that I really do think uh, other leaders should be aspiring to to do and and to be ultimately because words aren't enough and I know that you are um, one who always backs up what you say with with action. Um, John, have you any thoughts? I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on you know on, on how much of an impact you think sport can have uh, on wider society and business. Ultimately, because I know you do a, and, and sit across a number of different pieces these days with your commentating. Um, what are your thoughts? I, you know, I know we mentioned Piers Morgan before. You know, when we we may be, you know, maybe the the, the opposite of a of a David. <laughs> there, you know, when we kind of look at those who are, <laughs> are 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 saying maybe the right things, which is great, but it's more than words now. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, there are two aspects of sport. There's the participation and there's the administration. Now, of course, in the 70s and 60s and no, not the 80s necessarily, but there was a perception of a black footballer, of a black sportsman, whereby he was discriminated against because from a footballing perspective, I know lots of black goalkeepers, black defensive midfield players, black center halves in the 70s who never made it because the perception of the black footballer was that he can't think, put him on the wing, he's fast, he can run, he's skillful. All of, those melt, all of those myths were dispelled when we had David James, goalkeeper, Saul Campbell, centre-back, Paul, his first black captain, defensive midfield player. So from a playing perspective in football, there's no such thing as inequality from a playing perspective. A young black footballer will be given an equal opportunity as a young white footballer. He will earn the same amount of money. He will be given the same attitudes. People either think he's a good player or he's not a good player. And in fact, if you look at proportionately, there are many more black footballers than white footballers when you look at the, the, the population of the, of the countries. Of course, in athletics, the 100 meters probably will have at least six or seven black athletes in it, as with the long distances, whereas you may not have seen that in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. So from a playing perspective, there is equality. From an administrative perspective, that's, that's where we have to change. And how are we going to change that? How are we going to change that, once again, is to change the perception of a black man's moral and, moral and intellectual worth. So it doesn't matter whether a, 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 a footballer can spell his own name. If he can score goals, he will make it as a footballer and he'll earn equally as much as a white player. So what can sport do to change that? 
It doesn't need to do anything to change it from a participation point of view. Yes, in golf and swimming, and there are certain sports that we may think may not be Formula One racing, for example, as Lewis Hamilton says. So what can sport now do to stop racism? I'm not talking about the participation in a playing perspective. We're talking about participation from an administrative perspective. And as Raheem Sterling says, in the boardroom and, and you know, in a higher echelon of society generally, let's not kid ourselves as it's just football or sport. You go to the higher echelon of any industry, of any institution in the Western world, particularly in England, maybe in America, it may be slightly different. And you're not going to see black people there anyway. So I don't know why we're just throwing the finger at football or sport, because this is what happens. Now, what could Raheem Sterling do to change the perception of a racist football fan who may be consciously, unconsciously racially biased? What can Raheem Sterling do? Can he wear a t-shirt and say, say no to racism? And hundreds of years of indoctrination, of lying by the brightest minds in the world, Linnaeus, Blumenbach, David Hume, all of these great geneticists, anthropologists, scientists who spun this myth of racial hierarchy, intellectually and morally for hundreds of years, which is still embedded in our society and in our fabric. But because Raheem Sterling wears a t-shirt that says, say no to racism, they're gonna change their minds. And that's gonna change anything. I don't see how that's gonna happen. Secondly, Raheem Sterling is gonna influence, if there's a racially minded Manchester City fan who loves Raheem Sterling, is he all of a sudden gonna have an epiphany and say, Raheem Sterling says it's wrong to be racist, so I'm not gonna be racist anymore. What happens if Raheem Sterling leaves Manchester City and goes to another club? And what happens to the club he's left? Is he influencing any man, man, uh, Manchester United fans, any Arsenal fans, any Liverpool fans? No, he's not. So this idea that a black sportsman can change people's perceptions is naive. They cannot. It's impossible. The only way we can do that, the only way, we, he, can bring the, he can bring it to the fore, bring it to the attention, then we can have conversations around that. But what conversations are we having to try and deconstruct what we've learned for the last 400 years? Take a knee. Wear a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. Say we need a black man in the boardroom and everything is going to change. That is not going to happen. What we have to do is we have to explain to people why they feel the way they do. And I'll tell you why we have to change perceptions. The biggest mass lynching in America was in the 1880s, I think it was. No, 18, in, in the, 18, between 1850 and 1880. 35 Italians were lynched. Italians were lynched, hung. Because of course, back then, they had a perception of Italians. They had a perception of Irish as well, don't forget. So did they pass laws? Did they pass policy? to change people's perceptions that Italians are Irish people. There were no laws that they could have passed for people to change their perception. Whatever they did, they changed the perception of them. And until we change perceptions of, what black, of black people, that will continue. Now, once you change the perception, there will be no laws necessary. There'll be no policy necessary. There'll be nothing legal you can do if you change people's perception because people would automatically think that they're equal rather than you passing laws to, to force people because there are always ways around laws. It's been illegal to kill. It's been illegal to steal for a thousand years. But they're still killing and they're still stealing. Because all they've done is pass laws. And unfortunately, this is what we think we can do here. Pass legislation, pass laws. Because as I said, why Irish people and Italians in America now are equal, and there are no laws necessary to stop people discriminate about them, is because they change the perception of them. And no one's talking about changing perceptions. All we're talking about is passing laws, putting things in place, having quotas, and there are always ways around them. So I disagree 100%. Sport can do nothing to change people's perception. A racist football fan will still love Raheem Sterling at Man City because he's playing for Man City, but he's not going to change his opinion on other black people. And Raheem Sterling cannot change his opinion on other black people. So what we can do is to use our platform as sportsmen, as elite celebrities, singers, actors, to use our platform to bring the conversation about the solution and what we need to do. After that, what we need to do is to then deconstruct what we have learned which is from an educational point of view. And the only way we can do that is if we have the uncomfortable conversations about why we feel superior to begin with. And if you look at the history of America, the history of Britain, the history of the West, the history of Europe, it has been to colonize, it has been to create a narrative that there are people who are intellectually and morally inferior to us. And they have been black at the bottom, and of course, you have Muslims, you have whites, you have communists into that, you can have socialists into that, 
And until we deconstruct that, nothing will change. So yes, sport can do what it can to raise the profile and to highlight the problems. But in terms of changing things, sport can't do that. Interesting. I, I mean, I, I personally would, would politely challenge you on, on that, but fundamentally, I agree with what you're saying. I mean, this is, you know, it is systemic, and you mentioned the example there of um, Raheem Sterling wearing a T-shirt or another footballer wearing a T-shirt saying no to racism. No, it is the uh, the issue with modern society is that uh, we're influenced by a lot of what we see in the media, but ultimately you're saying, and I agree, it needs to go far deeper than that. Which bit would you challenge? I would challenge the piece where you say that sport can't have an impact on wider society and business. I think that it can. I think that it is very much, I agree with fundamentally what you are saying and everything else that you have said, because this is very much about the history and it is about bringing people along the journey, the imperfect people along the journey and ultimately um, sharing the real narrative, not the fake made up lying narrative. But I think sport can. I think sport can because in the same way that religion bodes this kind of emotion and, and kind of this feeling in us that it's, you know, almost a, you know, Cult is probably the wrong word, but you know, sport has, brings that emotive feeling that makes people listen and brings them together because you know, you've got to get them together. Sports yeah, you've got, you've, yeah, but you've got, yeah, but you've got to make tribal. them listen. Yeah, it's tribal. tribal. You've got to make which means that if you're a Man City fan, you listen to Raheem Sterling, you don't listen to any, you don't listen to a black player from Liverpool or Manchester United, you hate them. So, therefore, Raheem Sterling can influence Manchester City fans, which he could have influenced Liverpool fans when he was at Liverpool. What do you think Liverpool fans think about him now? So it is not bringing people together, it's bringing people who support that same club together. Mm. And so therefore, in terms of then influencing other people who don't support you, and they still have a negative perception of black people, he's not gonna make them change their minds towards black people. I think, you have, I think you have to separate, sorry, I think, because I've got a couple of challenges. I think it's a bit elliptical, that argument, because actually what you're suggesting is that Raheem, the target when, when someone like Raheem Sterling is, is campaigning is the racist fan. Actually, that's quite a stereotypical view of what a fan is, actually, because for many fans, and our experience when doing things like rehab training is not everyone is a career racist, even those people who make racist comments. Quite often, actually, they are coachable. If you look at the, the, the kid that abused Son, the Burnley fan, he was 13 years yeah. old and he'd been influenced yeah. by his father. And so we go in and we'll do some rehab training. And it's something that we're investing in and, and some of the other clubs are investing in. I think, I mean, you, you, you're right to say, look, football is the biggest tribe, tribal sport in the, in the world. And actually, in many ways, part of the problem is that politics has become too much like football because politics has become too tribal. And so actually, you know, we're all in these, and, and social media has exacerbated the tribes because now we no longer listen to anyone who's not in our tribe. And actually, we don't engage, I don't engage with your arguments, John. I'll engage with you as John and I'll criticise you. Actually, no, let me engage. We need to engage at the argument level. Yeah. So I think... You know, so to some degree, so to me, the impact of what Raheem does is about forcing the authorities to change. And so the reason why I'm in favour of things like take a knee and the gestures is only if it's sustained, because my, my suggestion is you need to keep the pressure on the authorities to do the things that they can do. And they won't do that unless you sustain the pressure. That's your power. To change an individual person's opinion, you might change some... I mean, I'll probably take issue with Raheem and Marcus. I think they actually transcend clubs. And I know a few folks from the Anfield Rap and, and folks like that. And, and, and they, they, you know, some of them will say, well, yes, yeah, it's quite embarrassing. We actually quite like Marcus Rashford. In the same way that I have a, you know, as a United fan, have a, have a slightly grudging admiration for Jurgen Klopp. Because there, there are many fans like me. The other bit that I'd actually probably take issue with is this myth that the pitch is a meritocracy. That's a load of crap. The reason it's a load of crap is, where are the people like me? Where, we are the biggest ethnic minority in this country. It's 42 years since a black player made their debut for England. We're still waiting for an Asian. And I'm hearing loads of things. I went out talking to sort of 200, 250 people as part of my listening tour around football. And I heard a number of times young Asian kids being said, having things said about them at scouting and academy level 
that were being said about black people 30 and 40 years ago and, and having things saying, you know, why should I invest, saying to the parents, why should I invest in your son when you're going to want them to be a lawyer or an accountant, right? And this is not actually even, I talked to some of my friends in the US who work in, in uh, grassroots football. I've got a friend who works in grassroots football in Atlanta. They have the same issues about Mexican kids. You know, the coach is saying, is it because you're eating tacos for breakfast? And it, those are the kind of systemic biases that we have, to, that we're coming up against. So, I mean, I agree with you. Look, the, the kinds of things that are being said about black players, you know, in the 1970s, you know, that seminal moment with Laurie Cunningham and Cyril Regis against United in December 1978. It's really important it was December because it was snowing because they said black players couldn't play in the snow and they yeah. absolutely decimated us, right? Those perceptions have gradually changed. Yeah, but we still have. So we have to change perceptions. Absolutely, so I completely so agree with you. Completely, agree. absolutely, absolutely. Just changing perceptions. It's not absolutely. passing laws. I, no, so, but, but, but so no. that's what I'm saying. Change perception. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, not suggesting we pass laws. I'm not suggesting we pass laws. I'm suggesting people make voluntary changes to set to set targets so that you make progress because you need to see those people better. But that's those are not the only things. That's the point. It's not. It's never one thing. The changing of perceptions takes time. That is going to take time. You, when are we going to start? When are we going to start changing perceptions? Because absolutely. no one talks about changing perceptions. We talk about we talk about affirmative action. We talk about quotas. Who is talking about changing perceptions? I've been saying this for 10, 20 years. And you, exactly you said there, why are there no Asian players? Because yeah. perception is they want to be doctors and lawyers. Yeah, exactly. So what do we do? Do we set quotas and pass laws? Or do we, act, or do we change perceptions? Or so so you're actually speaking for me. You're actually backing me up because I said you have to change perceptions and you, you said it there yourself. I'm saying you have to and do both. Secondly, I'm saying you have to do all second, of it. Oh, well, we have to do both. But more you importantly, perception, perception has to come first because like with the Irish and the Italians in America, we didn't pass laws or set quotas. We changed perceptions of them and look at them now. But we're still talking about quotas, passing laws with ourselves. And you said it yourself, we have to change the perception of the Asian not being a lawyer, doctor or, or going to school. And secondly, when he spoke about Raheem Sterling, and you said about who is he talking exactly? So you talk about the racists, right? So do, how many people do you think are, think that they're a racist? How many football fans do you think they're racist? I bet you ninety nine percent of football fans don't think they're racist. Of course they don't. Right. So when Raheem Sterling is talking to that one percent, yes, but he's talking to everybody. So the other ninety nine percent do not listen to Raheem Sterling because he's not talking about them, is he? Because they're not racist. But, so how are they going to want to change if they don't think they're racist? I don't think that's a target. I think the target is, like I say, me, the, the main target for people like that should be people in authority who can actually so, make the yeah, changes but, to the systems. But this, but this is so, the point I'm making in terms of the point I'm making in terms of not changing perceptions because if you are racist and you think he's talking about me, you're not going to change. And for the other 99% of fans, they're going to say, Raheem Sterling's not talking about me because I'm not racist until you get caught like the boy against Son or Peter Beardsley or, or Liam Neeson and the rest of them don't get caught. So they don't, they don't listen to Raheem Sterling at all because Raheem Sterling is not talking about them. So who is he influencing? Because 99% of them will say, I'm not racially biased. So who is he, Marcus Rashford, who is he influencing? They're not influencing anybody to change their perception. I mean, let's, let's be honest and uh, maybe take some of the, you know, we're all very passionate about this because we're passionate because society does not is not fair it is systemic whether it's in on the football pitch whether it's in the boardroom whether it's in the schoolroom we're all passionate and we're all passionate campaigners to actually do something about it i completely and utterly agree that the only way you get sustainable meaningful and lasting change is if you have conversations and people understand what it feels like to be black understand what it feels like to be asian in today's society and actually has becomes an ally because of that a tick box and law approach is not going to change. I totally agree with that. You do obviously do need a framework that actually gives a legal framework and the use of targets because targets, certainly for gender, have played a major role in ensuring that we see more equality across gender and a number of dimensions. So there is certainly a legal and a framework aspect to this. I think we all said at the beginning that the only way that this really, this moment, this is continuous dialogue, education, and changing hearts and minds. And you're never going to change everybody. But I'll tell you what, you change one person, if Marcus Rashford, and I'm sorry, I'm not really a football fan, so apologise, I'm, I'm a rugby fan. My partner Sally's a Chelsea fan, but you'll have to forgive her for that. If, if 
Marcus changes one person, that is one person. And that is better than changing nobody. So I take your point, John, that, you know, most people, and not only on the football pitch, if I go and talk to most people, as I was talking to people last week, and say, are you racist? Most people are even offended by that. They would never admit to being racist. Or they'll say, I'm not racist, but do nothing about the situation that exists either in the business or in society or in the communities. Because they're not racist, and therefore it's not their problem. And I think one of the things that is happening, and it's not going to happen overnight, is that people are starting to realise that it's not enough, and you've heard the phrase, Angela Davis used it in the civil rights movement, it's not enough not to be racist, you have to be anti-racist. But to be anti-racist, you have to understand what racism is and feels like. And that is the education. That is how you that is how you help to change the perception. There will always be people who have some form of racist and deeply held bias for whatever reason, and you're not going to capture everybody. But if you change one person, that is one person less. And if that person changes somebody else, and you see the spread, but I agree, you do it by conversation, you do it by action, and you do it in by having open comments, but also listening. I think there are times when people, um, let's say, I used to say white people will sit there and say, I'm not racist, and they want to have a conversation, and they'll, they'll, they'll try and have a conversation, they'll use the wrong language, and then we'll immediately jump in on them. But they're learning. And we've got to remember that people will make mistakes while they learn because they want to learn. And we have a duty to help them on that journey. Um, and so, yes, I agree. You have to change perception. You have to have some legal framework. And I do think that people who are in a position where they're seen and visible, we need more black role models. That goes out a doubt. We need black role models. And if we have somebody, you know, standing up, whether it's Marcus, whoever, and standing up and saying something, that will impact somebody because that 10 year old, maybe last week, would have used the N word, may think twice about it, which is brilliant. I agree, and not everybody's going to be affected that way, but I think we have to have some level of optimism if we want to see that change. Otherwise, we finish up fighting within our own network. Mm. Thanks for that, Andrew. And I, uh, you know, I think when it comes to supporting. Uh, white leaders who are, as you say, don't necessarily know the right thing to say. And I think that's part of the problem as well, because many leaders I speak to are so worried about being vilified for saying the wrong thing, but their heart is genuinely in the right place, that we do need to give a certain amount of leeway to actually help educate and give support in the best way that they possibly can and through through allyship but we touched briefly there on role models now role models i like to call them real models because i think it has to be real people that those whether they be uh, you know future leaders or, or the youth can look up to and aspire to potentially be like now john i know that you've got some strong views on this and again would love to explore these with, with everyone um and the thought that you know some youngsters when i've been speaking in schools for, for charity before in underprivileged areas some of the things that I hear are well if we can't see it we can't be it I'm not saying it's necessarily true all the time uh, I do think the role models are, are absolutely critically important but also real models and that we do need to see more people of color uh, and different diversities within the boardroom environment within business or within leadership roles but not in a way where it is just purely tokenism what are your thoughts well first of all I'm not a big fan of the black sporting role model as I've said a black sporting role model like Marcus Rashford is a great role model because he talks about the injustices in the inner cities and he uses his platform for that. He's a role model saying, I can't see it, so I can't be it. Which means that I can see a black footballer so I can be a footballer. No, you can't if you're a girl or you don't play football, which 99% of people don't. So to see a black footballer as a role model to say, I can do that, no, you can't. 99% of you can't. Well, take 50% straight away girls. Yes, you can have girls football, but not if you want to play for Liverpool or Manchester United, the men's team. Um, and of course, boxers, yes, we can box and we can run and we can play football. Until we are considered intellectually and morally equal, we will never be equal. So that's why I don't like the idea of black sporting role models in terms of, yes, you can be a sportsman. Yes, we have black sporting role models to say to these kids, you can be whatever you want to be. If you want to be a doctor, you want to be a lawyer. And that's why I like the idea of businessmen and professional people, black people, being role models for the black kids. Not so much in terms of, what the black kids may be, be able to achieve, but is the rest of society, white society, looking at them and thinking, yes, you are intellectually and morally our equal. 
we know you're our equal sporting wise. And of course, from a, as Sanjay would say, maybe from, a, from an Asian perspective, that they have that to overcome because they have to get into football and different sports. So that's the first thing. However, I'm much more interested in creating an atmosphere and creating an environment down in the inner cities to allow people to then be able to help themselves to become professional. Because you can, black kids in the inner city can look at a doctor, a lawyer, a businessman, and say, yes, I can do that. However, I'm going to be expelled by the time I'm 15. I won't be able to get a job. The housing, the education I'm going to get means that I am not going to be able to get there. Yes, there will be one or two. And you can always point to the fact that someone came from the inner city and he didn't have a, two parents, he didn't go to a good school, but he became a doctor, a lawyer, a businessman, despite his environment. Whereas I'm interested in creating a level playing field and a better environment down there so more people can actually give themselves an opportunity. Because what's the point of having, blacks, of, of having role models? I understand the point of having role models. Don't get me wrong. But in terms of saying to the kids, I did it, you can do it. And for 90% of the kids, they'll go, well, you know, I'm going to get expelled by the time I'm 15. I'm in, in a knife crime area. I can't even get a job. I have no chance of getting an education. But you're telling me that I can do that. Rather than us saying, let us put pressure on the council, on the government, which is what Marcus Rashford has started to do, just in terms of something as simple as school dinners, to create an environment down below to give those kids a real opportunity, to give the majority of them an opportunity. You'll always have brilliant kids coming through. So do you have to, have to, do you have to be a brilliant black man? to then come through to become a businessman. That's what you have to do now. To become a, 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 a black leader, you have to be a brilliant black man. We don't want that. We want the average black man to be given the same opportunity as an average white kid. So I understand the idea of role models and I can see it so I can be it. But if I can see it, how am I going to be it if I'm not even given an opportunity down here? And we can always point to one or two. Obama was the president of the United States. Have things changed for the people in the inner cities? Should he say to people, doesn't matter what happens to you down there, I became president, you can. No, you can't. We have to be realistic about it. And we have to be honest about it and start putting pressure, like Marcus Rashford has done, to create a better environment down there. Not a better environment up here, so that more elite people can give themselves a job and make sure people like them get a job when nothing changes down below. And there are a lot of people doing that. So I'm fine. I'll support that. But I was much more concerned with creating an environment down below. Yeah, absolutely. And ensuring that, that our grassroots are nurtured to be able to, to get up to higher levels in, in society, um, which is why I think allies are so important as well. Um, I know, David, you're, uh, you, you've been very, very supportive of Wrestle Like a Girl, which I think is fantastic um, uh, as well. Sorry, Sandra, you were going to say something. I was, was going to say, my actually, apologies, my no, apologies. I was going to say, I actually completely agree with John, so it's good because we're not going to have an art, we're not going to fight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I completely, I do completely agree with him, and actually be, partly because um, uh, I, I just want to build on it, actually, because it, it's, it's about hey, that going beyond BAME. I have to I really don't like that phrase. But, but actually, I suppose what I was slightly hinting at before was that the, one of the reasons why we use that phrase is actually in some industries in, and sporting industries, actually, very often the B hides the absence of the A, right? In business, the A hides the absence of the B. And so actually in both, I go, you need to go beyond both and you've got to disaggregate and say, is a different set of challenges that black and Asian people have. I walk in, in my business circles, there are loads of people now that look like me, all right? There aren't many that came from a council estate like I did, all right? And that's the kind of thing that where I completely agree with John. One of the other charities I work in is a social mobility charity called the Alito Foundation. And uh, our chairman is Sir Ken Alisa, who was the, who's the very first black chairman of the FTSE 100. And, and we're, we're focused on how we close that social capital deficit for those people that come from less affluent backgrounds. And, and this is a, that's the massive systemic problem. It's actually, you know, when I first came into the city, my biggest problem wasn't the talent. It was, I don't know what dress down Friday means. No one's told me. I haven't got all that, that, all that unwritten stuff that everyone knows. I didn't have that knowledge because I didn't go to private school and have all of that given to me. You start picking it up through through the education system and as you go through, through further education, but I was very lucky to get interventions personally 
to 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 allow me to go uh, th through through a particular pathway, but but that's the challenge is how you get people from 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 underprivileged backgrounds in particular, which it disproportionately impacts black and and very often also certain parts of the Asian community with the Bangladeshi and Muslim communities, uh, and, and I, so yeah, I, I mean completely right on football. You know, you, not everyone can be Marcus Rashford, not everyone can be Raheem Sterling. But actually, we, we, we do want that sense that anyone could be in a boardroom. Because actually, my experience is anyone can. Absolutely anyone can. You see, and in government, you see Dominic Raab yesterday. That I've seen that all the time. I was fortunate enough to get scholarships into, into Cambridge. Through that period and through getting to professional career, I have seen tons of people like Dominic Raab. They're bluffers. They're just bluffers. They bluff the lack of knowledge with guesswork like he guessed yesterday about taking knee means you see that all the time and it's a confidence trick and that's why if you come from a relative a poorer background you don't have that confidence to perform that confidence trick so yeah i want those role models to say doesn't matter what background you're from you can get to wherever you want to be um but you know in football it's a it's a, it's a very different thing so those i agree with john the role models work differently yeah and i i totally agree with john as well i mean I take the point about the black role model because it almost becomes a stereotypical thing in the sense that, okay, if you're black, you may well be faster than women, or you may be good on football pitch. Or it can also become that stereotypical thing as well as, no, you can't necessarily be me if you don't get the, the options to go. It. it has to be at that grassroots level. And one thing that really does wind me up, and I see it, and you may have all seen it, I see, and there's not a, not a large number of senior black leaders in the UK, let's be honest, but I see a lot of them, when they reach a certain point, pull ladder up. They're not interested in working, in mentoring, in working within the city, or with, you know, there's a number of programs that, whether it's in university schools, to actually help students, to give them mentors. I mean, the first time I went into one, my eye was opened in the sense that you're sitting there, with you know, 15 young black males, 14, and you're talking about you know, what they want to do. And the, the response that generally comes back, there'll be one or two who really do want to do something different, who will say, well, you know, I'll probably join one of the gangs, because that is the environment they work in. That's the environment that they're used to. That's the, there is no mentorship. There's no one to help or support and give them, and John's point, or, well, I won't be in school next week. You know, working with them, actually, Grassroots level is so important. That's why there's such a disproportionate amount because we're not giving that support. And what really gets to me is that we don't have enough leaders actually going, spending time, becoming mentors, and taking an active role in communities. We don't, we don't have it, especially from the you know the black leaders. They're not doing it, and therefore people are not seeing people that look like them. They're not getting that mentorship or that opportunity. And we work at the foundation, we do scholarships, it's only six per year, for, you know, for 16 year old black males, because the black males particularly um, from, you know, deprived areas are affected by this, where we actually get them scholarships through, all the way through to the university, university and give them option that they wouldn't have had before. But we need more companies to be actively engaged in the communities that they're supposed to support. And we need more leaders to be visible in those communities. Because there has to be leadership involved in that. And there has to be, you don't necessarily want someone, and believe me, there are, and it's great, but someone who is a white CEO coming into a school and saying, okay, yeah, you can come and sit in my chair at some point. And um, they need to see people that do look like them. That is important. That is important. But there are some people who say you need to be actively involved and take some responsibility. And I get fed up when people pull up the ladder when they've reached, because I'm all right, Jack, that's it, I'm done. And I think that is wrong. And I think that's disappointing. And that's something we need to actually have further discussions about and do something about it. All of us have a role. All of us on this call have a role to do more in our communities. I don't do as much as I should do, um, but I need to do more. But we all have a role to play in doing that. So yeah, totally agree with John, totally agree with Sanjay. It's, it's vitally important. Mm -hmm.
It really saddens me to hear, and I've seen it as well within business leadership where you were, uh, you know, or, or I've even felt, oh, wow, you know, I've seen in the press or read about, I, I don't know, it could be a female male CEO, whomever, and you think, wow, what a, what a brilliant, uh, what a brilliant role model. And you speak to these people and you realize actually, um, because they've had it particularly tough, and, and I don't know whether this is what you've seen, Andrew, but because they've had it so tough, they want it to be just as tough for you to get there. Um, and so it's not actually, you know, it's not the, uh, the rose tinted glasses, you know, supportive kind of uh, a mentor or, or, or supportive ally that you might have thought this person was. But obviously, there's lots of fantastic allies who are out there, you know, black white, whatever colored. And I think actually, um, I know you've popped back in now, David. Um, and I think, you know, David, love to know your thoughts on, on, on yeah, no, I, and allyship, I, because I it's think- It's great you know, to, 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 to sit back and listen. And, you know, I think, I agree with John, is that sport left to its own devices ain't gonna save the world. <laughs> that's, and that's the issue, is that, and I think perceptions you know, this is the reality is there are perceptions and roles that people have assumed in sport. Sport you know, is a wonderful book by, by um, a Harlem Renaissance writer uh, named uh, Ralph Ellison. It's called Invisible Man. And it talks about the bread and circuses of sport and how sport exploits. Um, and, you know, if you, if you the stories of, uh, Black boxers, Jesse Owens, you know, we can go on and on and on how sport has, you know, traditionally and systemically um, and spiritually has exploited and treated athletes as uh, racehorses. And that's the thing is that I think sport now, um, because it is, because it's become trendy, um, is now forced to put its money where its mouth is. Sport is claiming to be the panacea. Sport is claiming to be uh, the great savior. And because we elevate the fortunate few to a couple of roles um, that buys into this uh, capitalistic branding focus doesn't mean is actually a sustainable, reliable, and impactful pathway. It's still focused on exclusivity and privilege. And if you turn the whole thing on its head, if you look at, you know, one of the things I've, I've been reflecting quite a lot on is, um, you know, we have two thirds of the world's small states and island states, some of the world's smallest countries in terms of popu populace and some of the world's largest. Um, so the diversity of the, just the sheer demographic of what we're, of we're working with as a commonwealth is quite, quite remarkable. The number of island, small states and island states where you have brain, brain and talent drain from a small state, an island state. So, you know, a Trin, Trinidad and Tobago, a Barbados, uh, a Jamaica, will inevitably lose some of its top young talent to the States, to the UK. And people don't go back. People don't want to go back. It's seen as going back to the neighborhood. And that is a real challenge is that how do we, from a very early age, use the power of sport to start to uphold people's fundamental rights? So one of the things that we, five years ago, completely restructured the vision of the organization that through sport, we create peaceful, sustainable, and prosperous communities. You tell me another international federation that has that at the base of its foundation. And we didn't stop there. We didn't say these are just great esoteric words that we're going to throw like spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. We then came up with a framework. So most sport organizations, you know, uh, project and evangelize all these great values. And, and we were one of those organizations. Uh, humanity, equality, destiny was our values. But where we said we were going to measure our impact was on peace, sustainability, and prosperity. So if we go to Birmingham with the Commonwealth Games, have we made 
in order, you can't have sustainable and prosperous communities without peace. And peace starts with a fundamental respect, protection, and promotion of people's inalienable rights, their human rights. So we're using the platform of sport to talk about the right to education, the right, freedom of speech, freedom of association, using the power of sport, which when people start to recognize rights, then you can recognize marginalized groups. Then you can identify conflicts. Then you can start those painful, challenging journeys of truth, repair, reconciliation. Because you, you can't repair and have reconciliation without truth. And so peace, all these wonderful pillars of sustainable development, everyone's trying to go to the sexy bit before they've actually dealt with their duty of care. You can't, you can't, you know, get to protect, pr promoting and empowering people if you haven't respected and protected them. And that's the bottom line. And that's what we haven't done. And that's why sport does not have the power to change perceptions the way it is currently led, the way it is currently managed, the way it is currently organized, and the way it's currently promoted. And that's why sport has to flip the whole thing on its head, has to flip it upside down and not just relying on the fortunate few to take us to the promised land. <laughs> Absolutely. And they're that's here. it. And that's it. That's it. It actually you have to fundamentally reorganize sport. And it ain't going to come from a patriarchal hierarchy. It's going to come from people working smarter together. You see all these, you know, you see all these leaders that have emerged, female leaders have emerged through what's called an adhocracy. And that's an adhocracy is innovation, risk taping, taking, and collaborating, getting the best people in a community, in a family, to tackle the problems together. Sport doesn't operate like that. He who sits in the chair dictates all. And that has got to change if we want sport to uphold the promise that we all believe in. As, you know, that's the great, the great thing is, is that we all still have hope and love for sport. But sport, we constantly have allowed sport to inspire us and disappoint us. But at the end of the day, we are in the business of creating people's proudest moments. Sincerely, not artificially. And I, I just, you know, I'm, I, I feel that listening to the three of you affirms so much of what has to change, what has to change in sport in order for sport to do everything we believe it can. And it, it, says, it says this on the tin, so it must be true. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> so anyway, sorry for, sorry for the, the evangelism, but it, it's just, it's so inspiring to listen to each one of you because it just reaffirms you know, certainly the small part that the Commonwealth Games Federation is trying to play, you know, that there's a lot of work to do. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Leila, Leila, can I just pick up on what David said? Because I agree with him 100%. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, I'm from Jamaica. And ever since I was a young boy growing up in Jamaica, the Commonwealth Games, the Olympics, the World Championships, Jamaicans are good at athletics from Don Quarry in the 70s. And all of the Jamaican athletes used to go and train in America, live in America. Then all of a sudden, an environment was created through Tracks and Stars, whatever they're called, um, Usain Bolt's track team, for the Jamaican athletes, Asafa Powell, Usain Bolt, to live and train in Jamaica and still to be world champions. The idea was you had to go to America, you had to go abroad rather than staying in your own country. That has changed because an environment was created for people to maximize their potential right where they are. Now, you talk about, I think, I don't know whether it was Andrew talking about pulling the ladder up, which I understand. We have a lot of leaders, not just, not just black, but a lot of leaders, who came from the communities, who then pulled the ladder up and they've got where they've got to. And we're still talking about getting more people up there, more people up there to help people up. What's more important and what would be better, which we will be able to get more people there, is if you create a platform down below for people to climb up themselves. Yeah. How many people can you pull up? How many people can climb up themselves? Many more. And you'll affect positively many more people by creating an atmosphere at grassroots, to use a sporting term, but grassroots is about education, housing, jobs, creating an environment down there for people to help themselves up the ladder rather than you pulling them up because that has never worked from the Magna Carta to the American Revolution where you had an elite, elite group of people saying get me more power 
and then I'll help you up. That has never happened in 2,000 years, and it's not going to happen now. So we have to create an environment down below for people to help themselves. Yes, we have to do both. I understand from the visible point of view of seeing that, but what's more important is that platform down below, which is what, and I say, look at Raheem Sterling, and I love Raheem. I think he's a fantastic player, and his heart is in the right place he wants to do. So I say to Raheem Sterling, Raheem, instead of giving 250 semi-final tickets at Wembley for Manchester City to people from your community in Stonebridge Park, and people say what a great thing that was. Yes, he's given 250 tickets. Take those 250 kids who are disenfranchised, can't get a good education, they're in a, an area which is rife with knife crime. Take them to a press conference and say, these kids are being disenfranchised, being discriminated against, they can't get a good education. That will help them more than giving them 250 cup final tickets. And that is why I go back to Marcus Rashford. He could have given those kids cup final tickets instead of school dinners, but now he's saying this is going to help them even more by highlighting the problems that they're actually having. Thank you, John. And before we wrap up today, just because I'm conscious of time, and John, I know that you have to uh, you have to leave us at half past. I wonder whether before we wrap up, we could do as big a shout out as we possibly can to those who are listening in and those who tune in on demand as to what we can impart upon them to uh, to go ahead and take action. I know that um, the conversation with all of you today, um, and it's been incredibly powerful, you know, it's been insightful, you know, for, for, for me as well, you know, I'm learning and I think, you know, like everyone uh, in the world at the moment, we are, we are learning and we are doing our absolute best, but ultimately people can do do far more and leaders can do far more and so I'd love to hear from you before we go you know just a couple of words and, and a couple of parting words for those that are listening in and especially leaders uh, and people in positions of power that can affect change in one way or another. Sanjay I'm going to start with you this time if that's okay. Yeah sure I mean I think look what, what's great about a conversation like this is you'll hear lots of different perspectives and people people don't always have to agree. What's really important is that you get the ideas out on the table. Uh, uh, and actually, you, you know, the reality is all of these things need to be need to be done. Uh, and there are lots of different ways in which people can get involved. Really, my, my uh, I suppose my request is don't don't waste this moment. If if this is if this has caused you to be interested in doing something if it caused you to be interested to make a gesture of solidarity that's not enough you, you've got to do something you've got to contribute uh, so don't you know don't don't focus on don't be just a commentator and that's that bit really irritates me these people are identifying just the problems fine identify them but we have to come up with practical solutions as well and things that could, things that people can do. So focus on the practical solutions and the things that you can do and what your contribution can be. But you've got to do something. It isn't, isn't you know, the gestures are just not enough on their own. It's a good start, but it's not enough on its own. Just so so if you if you become involved, stay involved. Thank you, Sanjay. Andrew. Um. It's not enough to, as you said, just to say, and this is what I'm to leaders, it's not enough to say, I'm not racist. You have to be anti racism to, you know, to get to that point, you have to educate yourself about what the experience is like with people that, particularly if the black community is like, and what it means today in Britain to be from an ethnic minority. You have to educate yourself, and, you know, it's. It, you can't learn what you're fighting against if you don't understand what you're fighting for. So you need to educate yourself. And there's a couple of things I would say, you know, if you want to start on that journey, if you actually do want to be active, if you want to be an activist and actually really help, but also help your teams. If you're a leader, you've got a team. What are you going to do? It's no longer down to myself and Sanjay, yourself, David, John. We can't do it on our own. You need the leaders to actively, because ultimately they will have they have the responsibility in whatever reason it is, whether it's in the football club, whether it's for the business, they're ultimately responsible. So they have to take some actions. They have to understand and then follow through on them. And a couple of things, you know, they could do this weekend, and they could go to Netflix and watch the thirteenth, and understand about 
you know, the black experience of slavery. Read, you know, why I'm no longer talking to white people about race to understand or start to understand the challenges that people face. You know, educate, advocate and invest. Educate yourself and educate yourself in conversations, speak to people, understand, listen to understand, not to reply. Become an advocate about, you know, what it means to be anti-racist and invest, invest in communities, invest in people, and invest time to really drive change. That would be my ask. Thank you, Andrew. David? Yes, and, and I think the message that keeps coming up is having the courage to be vulnerable. I think many of us lack that courage to be vulnerable. And, unless uh, it unless it's a do or die situation and I think what COVID and uh, and certainly this recent reminder and surge of activity around the freedom struggle and and the broader struggle for equality has done is remind us, it's given us a, remi a reminder of the importance of having that courage to be vulnerable, to make the change. It's not good just complaining about change. It's about, or holding back change. We need to now, all of us, because we're better connected and we're better informed than ever before because of these God awful things. <laughs> And I think that starts with people's ability to learn how to respect one another, learn how to listen, not just hear, but listen to learn before we open our big mouths. And I think that is a critical, critical lesson that I've learned is that learning how to show respect is so important. You know, there's not a country I don't go to that has been emancipated that I don't make a visit to a symbolic location that recognizes that emancipation and that independence because it is such a critical, fundamental connection of respect for the people, for the culture, that if I don't do that, then I'm not connecting like I should be. And I've learned that through the discussion and dialogue and, and having some quite vulnerable conversations. Um, and, you know, I think so. I think having that courage to be vulnerable can help us all grow, but also help us fight the condition of racism and hopefully achieve some of the ideals of freedom and fairness and equality and, and justice for everyone. Thank you, David. John, I'm conscious of time, but would love to hear from you last and never least. Well, I want to talk to all the racially biased people, if they exist, because we'll all say we're not. And why I say racially biased is because I don't want to say racist. Racist is such a horrible word that people get defensive. They don't want to be called racist. Whereas if being racially biased is a softer term, we could all probably admit that we're all racially biased based on what we have been wrongly told about different groups of people. So when I say racially biased, a lot of us will then listen. If I say racist, a lot of people won't listen. Now, we're all racially biased because of what we have been wrongly told about different groups of people. We're all sexist to a certain degree. You can see the way men feel about women, about gays. And if I was to ask a question, would you rather go to war with a man or a woman? We would all say it doesn't matter. Um, it, the best person for the job, but we know that not to be true, but because we're afraid of getting fired and we're afraid of you know, being called sexist or racist, we don't admit it within ourselves. That's why I use racially biased. Now, don't be ashamed, don't be embarrassed. This is the way we have con been conditioned to think for hundreds of years, and we are continuing to do it now. So the people who are racially biased, of which I'm one, and I'm happy to say that, because I have been wrongly taught, conditioned, and as much as I'm only 56 years old, and, but this is the way systemic racism works or racial bias works for hundreds of years. First, to think negatively about different groups of people. And until we admit it within ourselves, we can always wait for someone to get caught. Like Derek Chauvin, 
with George Floyd, Amy Cooper, Peter Bears and Liam Neeson point the finger at him and say, isn't it terrible? Pat ourselves on the back because we, we believe that a racist is someone who wears a, a, a member of the Ku Klux Klan, far right, neo-Nazi, um, white supremacist. And as long as that's not you, you're not racist or not racially biased. Now, why I say Amy Cooper, and I'm glad what happened to Amy Cooper. Amy Cooper, who we all know Amy Cooper, the woman who called um, the police on the black man in Central Park who was bird watching. Amy Cooper is a white, liberal, left-wing, Obama-supporting, Trump-hating woman who if that ha didn't happen six weeks ago, she would have been on the front line for Black Lives Matter. But in times of confrontation, which is what football fans come up against every single week, in times of confrontation and stress, we, our default position is the person I'm confronting, how have I been conditioned to think about them? Not consciously, how have I been unconsciously conditioned? And that is why Amy Cooper did what she did. That is why Scott Bethman, I think his name is, the, the US Navy guy who got caught up with his wife talking about black people and, 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 and Asians. And that is who we all are. And until we're going to admit it, nothing will change because we'll just wait for someone to get caught, point the finger at them, and then feel better about ourselves. But I'm telling you, we are all Amy Cooper. And just like an alcoholic, the most important thing and the first step that you have to take to stop being an alcoholic is to put your hand up and say, I'm an alcoholic. Or else we can't do it. But unfortunately, what we do in society is we point the finger at people who get caught, convince ourselves that we are, believe in equality for women and for gays and for, for black people, and we convince ourselves of that, and nothing will change until we own it within ourselves. And that's the first starting point. And until we do that, we can't take the second, third, fourth, fifth, fifth sixth steps. So we have to own and acknowledge it within ourselves. Hear, hear. Thank you ever so much. Um, thank you ever so much to, to, to all of you. Each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart is an absolute inspiration. And I really, you know, it, it makes me sad. It keeps me awake at night at the moment, all the awful stuff going on in the world. But I think we absolutely critically must have hope. And each of you have got very individual and powerful voices and platforms with which to use. And so my plea to everyone who is listening in today uh, or watching would be that there is never a more important time ever and to step up right now. No one's perfect. We're all human beings. If you strip away everything else from the surface, we're all flesh and blood underneath. And so really, we're all vulnerable. We're only here for a finite amount of time. So please do something. You can all do something, however small it might be. And as you said, David, before, I think courage and, and being vulnerable, I think the best leaders, most inspirational leaders I've ever met in my life are the ones that are willing to be vulnerable and to put their hands up and say that they are not perfect or that they are wrong sometimes. So, so thank you all very, very much indeed for being a part today. I'm very grateful. I know how very busy you are. And so it's a challenge just to get you all in the same virtual room anyway at one time. So, so thank you, uh, Sandra. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, David. Yes. Thank you, John. Nice to meet all of you. Um, thank you. All the best. You today. Thank you. Um, okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much. You. My name is Layla McKenzie Dallas. You've been listening to the Dark Global Lounge. You can check this out online afterwards on demand at www.darkglobal.org. And we'll see you again very soon.